Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. One of my friends who in the legal profession, a man by the name of Bruce, was a good friend. He and I talked many times about cases, and he referred cases to me, and, and I had him work on some cases that I had. We became good friends professionally and otherwise. On one occasion, I received a telephone call from him, and he said, Hans, he said, I need to talk to you. And so I said, sure, Bruce, where? Would you like to, me to come to your office? Do you want to come here? And so I wound up going to his office, as I recall, and we were talking, and he told me that he had just been indicted. Now, Bruce was an extremely successful attorney. He had no reason to do what he did. And yet he defrauded many of his clients for millions of dollars. And he was now being indicted, and probably would not only be criminally indicted, but would probably lose his license to practice law. He and I talked on various occasions about how best to handle his own situation. And on one occasion, he came up with the decision that he was going to commit suicide. He went to Cleveland to talk to a psychiatrist because he wanted some help outside of the Columbus community where he was well known. So he went to Cleveland to talk to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist told him that it was a rational decision for him to make, that under these circumstances, a reasonable person could commit suicide. Where that psychiatrist ever got that idea, I don't know. But I do know that it had a devastating effect upon Bruce. He now set on a course that took him right down to a suicide which he eventually committed at Lake Mead in Nevada, uh, the United States. State, it's a state, as you know. Not, not the community out here. In any case, he committed suicide. And before he committed suicide, he decided that he was going to live as high as he could. He loved to eat. You could tell that by looking at him. He loved to eat. And so he decided that on the last day of his life that he was going to actually rent or lease or whatever you do for an Italian hotel in New York City. He loved Italian food and he basically closed down the whole restaurant and he said, I'll pay you whatever you need, whatever you want for this day. I just want everybody to serve me and to serve the food that I want. That's how he spent his last day before he went off to the van where he committed suicide. How would you spend your last day? What would you do? You might think that that last day is far off. Others might think that it's not, that it's very soon. But how would you spend your last day? If you knew that you only had one day to live, what would you actually do? Would you drown yourself the way he did, literally? Would you drown yourself in sorrow? Would you eat all that you can, in other words, stuff yourself selfishly? What would you do? Well, we have some indications of what Jesus did. And I think we can learn from that. In the 13th chapter of John that we just read a few moments ago, we started off, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave the world. In other words, he knew that this was the last day of his life. And he went to, that he would go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. In other words, even when he knew that he only had one day to spend, what did he do? He loved his own. He loved the disciples. And he instructed the disciples. He instructed them with how they should deal with life. And we read that and we'll go over it a little bit more in just a few moments. But the centerpiece, the centerpiece of his instruction came in the 34th verse of the same chapter where John writes, quoting Jesus, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Love one another the way I have loved you. Jesus is taking old commandments. It isn't a new commandment here in the sense that it's never been heard before. It's a new commandment in the sense that he is injecting into all of the old commandments a standard and a vitality that never existed before. It's the standard of what he would do and has done and what he would continue to do even unto the cross. So he gives a new commandment. He gives it to them, and he gives one to us. So what makes this so new? Well, the first thing is 
that we are dealing here with a new attitude. Jesus, Jesus is introducing a new attitude to his disciples. Let's look at this in terms of two dynamics that were going on. You probably will remember reading in Luke in particular, and in Mark and various other places, where the disciples were arguing with one another as to who was the biggest, who was the greatest, who was the most important, who was going to have the most prestige in the kingdom, who would sit next to Jesus. They were arguing about their position in the kingdom of God. In fact, we know from the Gospel according to Luke that they were engaged in this very argument at the very time when Jesus introduces this new commandment. And I wonder whether he was introducing this new commandment partially in order to help them to see how, how small they were in their perspective, how limited they were, and how necessary it was for them to break out of the usual ways of looking at things, the pecking order that we so often establish even in our societies today. And so that's the first dynamic. The second dynamic that's going on here is that Jesus is doing something that must have seemed extremely strange. Now in that society, we talked about it a few years ago when I polished Mark, uh, Mike's shoes as sort of a symbol of washing feet. Remember we talked about the fact that in those days, in the first century, people would walk in sandals and would walk in the dirt, and the dirt was not just pure little dirt that was raked every day, it had manure in it and all sorts of excrements, etc., etc. And they would walk in this, and then when they would visit somebody, it would be a slave. Either a slave would wash their feet, or they would be handed the basin so they could wash their own. No respecting person, free person in that society would ever wash anybody else's feet. That was a job that was either done by yourself or done by a slave. And so the second dynamic that is going on here is that Jesus is pointing them to a task, to a way of living which seems to be demeaning, which seems to be worthy of a slave but not of a free person, not somebody who had power and prestige. And so the disciples not only were against the whole idea of washing feet because of their position that they wanted to maintain, but they also knew that this was a demeaning job that they were given. In fact, the rules stated in those days that if you were a follower of a rabbi, you had to do many things for the rabbi, but you could draw the line of washing the feet. That you didn't have to do. So when Jesus gets up and he begins to actually wash their feet as an example, it must have been startling as it was to Peter. It must have been startling for Peter because as he said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. He couldn't fathom anyone doing that. It broke through the standards of society, the mores of society, in such a significant and decisive way that people couldn't understand what he was doing. And that it was important for them to recognize because of the new commandment which requires a new attitude, an attitude of servanthood. And that's not just true for the disciples at that particular occasion. It's true for you and me as well. For example, in Philippians, we find in the second chapter, you find the statement, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And he goes on to say that Jesus was in a downward moment. In other words, he had the right to stay in heaven. He had the right to exalt to be exalted. He had the right to be in heaven. And yet, he did not count any of those things worthy to hold on. And he came here. Why? To humble himself, to be a servant. As he said on another occasion, when they were again talking about who was most important, he said, don't you realize, he said, I came here to serve, not to be served. And he wants us to accept the same attitude, to have the same attitude. So that's the first thing. It takes a new attitude. And we are challenged, not just the disciples, but we are challenged to have that same attitude of serving. But it requires more than that. It requires not just a new attitude. It requires new action. If we read scripture honestly without sort of injecting our own biases into it and our own desires and our own wishes, if we read it objectively, we'll see again and again that Jesus and the disciples and the, who wrote the various books in the New Testament and the Old Testament, they never stop at just having a change of attitude. 
Jesus wasn't satisfied with them just having a change in attitude. We can't be satisfied with just having a change in attitude. We can't just say, okay, I can accept that. We ought to be servants. Good enough. And stop there as if nothing else were required of us. Because the fact is, as we read in the 17th verse of John 13, we read there, now that you know these things, you will be blessed, what? If you do them. Do you see the significance of the language there? It's not if you, you will be blessed if you know them. It's not a test that's going to be given to see whether you can check off the right box, whether you can come up with the right answer, whether you can come up with the right multiple choice. That's not it at all. We have to have a changed attitude. But if that doesn't lead to action, there is no blessedness in it. We are blessed if we do that. And what are we to do? He spells it out even more clearly in the 15th chapter of John where he says, My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Do you see how incredibly important this passage is for us? How incredibly demanding it is? How incredibly important and demanding it is because we are challenged, not, what? Not just to have the right attitude, but to be willing to give our lives for our friends. Let me ask you, do you have a friend? Do you have friends? Are you fortunate enough, blessed enough to have a friend? Would you really be willing to give your life for that person? Oh, it might be easy for you to say, sure. Sure, I would. Or maybe you were more honest and with yourself and you say, I would hope that I would be able to do that, but I don't know whether I can. It's an incredibly demanding standard that Jesus gives to the disciples and he gives to us. But he's willing to do it. I mean, just remember, in the 13th chapter, what do we read? After God had given all things into his hands, is that interesting? After God had given all things, all power into his hands, what does he do? And if God gave me all the power, I can think of a few things that I would probably want to do. Most of those centered on making me better or making me life more easy for easier for me. But what does Jesus do? He takes all that power, all those things that have been placed in his hands, and he uses those same hands to serve his disciples and to serve us. But if you're interested in exploring this further in your own mind, let me point you to another passage in the letter of 1 John. In 1 John, in the third letter, we have John again basically reciting what is written here, namely that uh, we are to love one another. This is how he, what he writes. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. He really reiterates what Jesus said earlier that we read from the 15th chapter of John. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and the truth. You see, the same theme, attitude, activity, incredible challenging activity, the doctrine of awareness, and then we're not just judged on attitude, but on action. But here's what's interesting. What John is doing here, I think, is not only saying that we are challenged to give our life for our friends, which may be sort of in the abstract something, as I said before, that we might be willing to do, but don't really know whether we're willing to do it in the concrete. And then John writes something, and he gives us a way of sort of testing our own selves. And we test ourselves, and he writes, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And then he says, now if that seems to be so big, something that you can't agree to here, 
He says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? We might not be able to answer the question as to whether we would give our life for our friend. But we can answer the question whether we're willing to share our material possessions. Perhaps not buy another storage place. Perhaps have a smaller house. Perhaps have less land. I don't know what the situation might be. Whether we're willing to share our possessions with others. And the answer to that question may help you understand the answer to the bigger question. And I was reading that this morning, sort of putting finishing touches on this, trying to understand and trying to see how I might apply this, and the telephone rings. And I pick up the telephone, and there's a voice on the other side that says, uh, do you people have gas cards? And my first response was no. Well, we, we don't. I have a card that I can use for gas, but I don't have a gas card. And I was annoyed. I was busy in the higher reaches of theological discussion, like trying to understand what Scripture is saying, to come down here and tell me how all of you must give your life and be willing to give your life for your friends. And here's a guy who wants me to take some material possession. Oh, Lord, God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Right in the middle of by trying to understand this text, I get a telephone call asking me to share my material possessions with him. I almost said no again. I came this close. And all my natural tendencies were to say, no, leave me alone. I have more important things to do. But you see, we don't have more important things to do. The reality is, as Jesus says to the, to the disciples in the 13th chapter of John. He goes on to talk about the commandments, and we have now looked at the new attitude we have to have, the new action we have to have. He says you also have to have a new community. And the new community, he describes in the following way. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Do you hear that? As a community, we will be recognized. As a church, we will be recognized. As St. Paul, we will be recognized as a community that belongs to Jesus by the way we treat each other, by the way we love one another, by the way we are there for one another. People will look at this congregation and say to itself, is that a place where Jesus is alive, where Jesus is celebrated? They will know our new community by the way we love them. You see, Jesus knows that his disciples are going into a world where they will be hated. And you and I will live in a world, if not yet, we will continue to live in a world where we increasingly will be hated because of our faith. And the only way that we can survive is if we accept this new standard to be known by the way we love them. A new commandment Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said. And we know what that means. We know that that means that he was willing to be crucified for each one of us. In the fourth century, there was an Asiatic monk, a Christian monk, whose whole job was to tend this garden and make sure that there were enough vegetables and whatever necessary to feed the cloistered community, the monastery that was there. He also loved reading the scripture, and he was a devotional, contemplative monk who most, spent most of his time reading scripture. And the other time that he had left over, he would spend in this little plot of land, the garden that he had. And on one occasion, he got this feeling that he ought to go to Rome. <coughs> that he ought to go to Rome and, and be there. He said he had, no, he had no understanding why he wanted to go to Rome, but he felt that he needed to go something side of him was compelling him to go there. And so one day, after thinking about this for 
apparently there was a considerable length of time he fed it off to its wrong. And when he got there, he was shocked by the filth and by the noise and volume. He, all, all that he could think about probably was to go back to his little garden plot where it was peaceful and his books that he read and the prayers that he would say. But he was sort of caught up in a crowd as he was there. And the crowd seemed to be moving in a particular direction. In fact, they were moving towards the Colosseum where gladiators were about to kill each other. And he found a place in the perimeter wall and he was watching this as one gladiator after another walked up to Caesar and said, Hail Caesar, we who are about to die salute thee. As he was listening to this and then saw the gladiators killing each other, he could no longer stand. He had to do something. And so he stood on the perimeter wall and he yelled out, In the name of Jesus, forbear, stop. In the name of Jesus, forbear. The gladiators just continued, and he continued to yell. And finally, he had to go into the sand floor of the Colosseum, and he did it. He ran out there to the gladiators, and the gladiators continued to fight, and he continued to yell, In the name of Jesus, forbear. And the crowd became annoyed with him and, and yelled, Kill him, run him through. And one of the gladiators took his sword and just cut him to eviscerate. And as he was lying there with his blood running into the sand, the Colosseum became quiet. And one person died, and two people died. And pretty soon, everyone in the Colosseum had left. That was on January 1st, 404 AD. Ever since then, there's never been a Speaking to someone here who's 